welcome to the Therapy for Black Girls podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 104 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. In today's episode, we're digging into prolonged exposure therapy. For this conversation, I was joined by Jason Phillips. Jason is a life coach, psychotherapist, and lecturer who advocates relentlessly for prosperity and wellness to strengthen individuals, couples, families, and communities across the globe. Jason has worked in a myriad of settings to include hospice work with grief and loss, college campuses, community mental health, veterans, and active duty soldiers. He has over 10 years of experience in the mental health and coaching profession and is considered an expert in evidence-based treatment and strategic goal setting to foster success. Jason and I chatted about what prolonged exposure therapy is, how it can be useful to treat PTSD, how to find a therapist who practices it, and he shared some of his favorite resources. If you hear something while listening that really resonates with you, please be sure to share it with us on Twitter or in your IG stories using the hashtag TBG in session. Here's our conversation. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Jason. Thank you, Dr. Joy, for having me on. I'm really appreciative of this opportunity. We met, of course, on Instagram and you were participating in our Three for Thursday, which is the live video we do on Facebook and Instagram every Thursday. I was like, okay, this guy seems like he really uses this prolonged exposure (laughs) therapy as a modality. And so I would love for him to come and talk with the audience about this. So can you tell us, Jason, let's start by talking. And of course, on several episodes, we've talked a little bit about PTSD, but nothing in depth. So can you tell us what PTSD is? Good question. Yes. So PTSD is a form of anxiety. So it's an anxiety disorder where an individual has suffered some type of traumatic event. And since that event, they have significant distress. So it's causing them to lose sleep, possible nightmares, avoiding things that remind them of whatever happened. And Sometimes they have recurring images of that event. So some type of flashback. It's just they can't seem to shake whatever experience happened to them. And that's how if that lasts over a period of one month, then typically they see a clinician and are screened and can possibly have the diagnosis of PTSD. Okay. And I think most people are still kind of learning about PTSD. I think for a long time, PTSD is something that had been only associated with like military veterans or people had been in combat. And of course, there are tons of different traumatic experiences that you could have that could lead to a diagnosis of PTSD. Dr. Joy, you're right. A lot of times it is typically paired with soldiers and combat, but PTSD, the trauma could come from a sexual assault. It could come from an accident, whether it's a car accident. There could be anything traumatic that this happened to you, a specific event. It could be if you were abused, some type of physical altercation. So yeah, it's just not limited to combat, war, or soldiers. Right. And Jason, isn't there a part of the diagnosis that talks also about fearing for your life or or that you could have been harmed in some way? Am I correct in that? Yes, you are very correct. So in order to meet the criteria for PTSD, either your life must have been threatened or you watch somebody else whose life was either threatened or severely injured or I say or again, but or sexually violated. So that's where it encompasses not only your life being threatened, you witnessing someone else being injured or their life being threatened, but also any type of sexual violation. Okay. Okay. Got you. Yeah. And I think that's, again, the part that maybe people don't always know is that it doesn't have to be that the thing happened to you. It could have also been something that you witnessed. Right. Or repeated exposure to images that are horrific. Okay. Okay. With the DSM. Okay. With the newest update. Yes. 
Got you. Okay. So Jason, you of course practice something called prolonged exposure therapy, which is kind of a gold star recommendation in terms of treating PTSD. Can you tell us more about what prolonged exposure therapy is? Yeah. So prolonged exposure therapy is an evidence-based treatment. So there's been decades of research to prove that this treatment works for individuals with PTSD. And in summary, prolonged exposure therapy has two big components in it. One of those components is imaginal exposure and another is in vivo exposure. And with prolonged exposure therapy, the person is telling their story, not like you tell somebody what happened, but they're telling their story or they're re-scripting the trauma in first person. So as if it were happening now, and when they're telling a story, it's recorded. And the reason it's recorded is because part of the exposure therapy is to go back and listen to that recording. And again, there's two big components, the imaginal exposure. So you're actually telling the therapist what happened. And then there's in vivo exposure where you're going back to doing things that you've avoided. So for instance, if you've been avoiding large crowds or if you've been avoiding certain sounds or smells since that trauma, that's a huge part of the therapy is to you know work with the therapist so you can stop avoiding whatever it is you're now avoiding since that trauma. Okay. So tell me more about the recording the trauma and then playing it back. How is that then used in therapy? So prolonged exposure therapy does typically about eight to 10 seconds. Sessions. So you don't start off recording the sessions or you do start off recording the sessions, but you don't start off recording your actual trauma. Session three is when you actually describe what happened to you. And with that, to answer the question, as far as recording it, you record it and you listen to it daily, at least once per day, so that you not only just hear what happened to you, but you kind of habituate to your story. So no longer do you want to be so aroused when you're talking about this traumatic event. You want to be able to listen to it and hear some things that you may have missed. Maybe you're blaming yourself and by recording According to it, you can hear, wait, I was scared in that moment. So maybe I didn't cower or it wasn't my fault. And a lot of times you can't hear that when you're talking about it. But when you listen to it, you hear it differently. Oh, okay. And this, you know, for those of you who are listening, this is something that I know very little about. So I'm learning at the same time as you guys are. So this definitely sounds fascinating. So Jason, you said that this would not happen, though until session three. So what are you doing in sessions one and two? I'm guessing there's some prep work before you get to this session. Yeah. So these questions are great because (laughs) there's a lot of myths around prolonged exposure therapy and people think that talking about the trauma will make it worse when reality, not talking about it makes it worse. It makes it more daunting, more scary. So in session one and two, we're really focusing on the client or the individual understanding the rationale for the treatment. You have to buy into it and you have to understand why you're going to talk about it. You have to understand why you're going to revisit these places and situations that you've avoided. Because if you don't understand why you're doing it, you're going to think that's stupid. This is going to make me worse. You're going to get to session three and four. And when it's time to actually describe what happened, you're not going to want to do it. You're going to back out and drop out. So sessions one and two focus on building rapport with the client and actually going over some common reactions to trauma because losing sleep, having intimacy, difficulties, whether it's accepting love, giving love, fear, being angry at the world, being angry at yourself, all of these are common reactions to trauma that we just don't know about. We think we're the only one experiencing this. So the therapist and the client spend the whole hour, and these sessions are typically 90 minutes because It's just so much information being processed. So those first couple of sessions are really spent to make sure you understand why you're doing the treatment. Yeah, I would imagine that this would probably not be something somebody would just sign up for automatically, right? Like, I feel like there would have to be some buy-in and somebody really even explaining to you why this would even be helpful for this to even feel like it would be an attractive treatment. Yes, because it's sometimes when you're just describing the treatment, you can see the distress in them, the they become anxious just thinking about talking about it. Right. Yeah. Like this thing that I'm already like super afraid of. I was traumatized by. I've been spending all this energy to try to avoid thinking about it. And now you're telling me that in a matter of three sessions, we are going to be talking all about it. And then you're going to want me to replay it every day. Right. Right. Yes. Dr. Joy, you're right. It's almost like um, I think about it, the trauma 
the way we process it or did not process it, it's almost like a closet that's stuffed with a bunch of clothes. Mm -hmm. So when you and the therapist work through it, you're sorting out the trauma, you're taking things out, you're giving some stuff away. So then you can open that closet door and all the clothes don't just pour out, but you can actually see what's going on and be able to look at it from a different lens. I love that, Jason. So you said something really interesting in in terms of like somebody listening back to the replay of their telling the story that they may realize that they can like point out some emotions that they miss or their pieces that they miss. Is this something that you're training them to do or like how do you move through session three to them having this homework then of like re-listening? What are the instructions for like when they're listening at home? Mm, so another good question. So there's a lot of homework involved. I will say that this is a very intense treatment protocol. Mm-hmm. You would want to designate at least one to two hours per day because you need one hour to listen to the session and the one hour to do the actual in vivo exposure homework assignments. And before we get to uh, session three, where you're actually talking about your trauma, we're going to rate that. We're going to have a, a scale where you can measure your level of uh, discomfort or distress from zero to 100. So you pick what that scale looks like. You know, we, we have what's called anchor points. So you would describe what's your 100, what's your zero, what's your 50. That way, when you're going through the imaginal exposure, I'm going to be asking you every five minutes, where's your level of distress? And you'll give me a number and you'll get right back to the trauma. So it's not really conversational. So it's very different than traditional psychotherapy because you're going to be doing a lot of talking. I'm going to be asking you probing questions. I'll be making sure that you stay engaged and you're not telling me in the third person, but you're actually describing what's happening in the moment. That is called a, a sub scale, but it's a subjective unit of distress scale that you're going to, again, every five minutes, give me a number. And that way, as the sessions progress, we can easily see whether your suds are, are going down or up. Hmm. Okay. And if they're going up, then what happens? Uh, if they're going up, we will look at what is happening. Are you listening to the homework or to the sessions? When it comes to the in vivo sessions, that which, which means doing things in real life, are you going out to, for instance, Walmart? If you've been avoiding Walmart, are you going out to Walmart every day and spending at least 45 minutes or so in the store because when you're avoiding something and if you only go for, let's say, a few minutes, that doesn't give your body enough time to habituate your distress level to come down. All you're doing is popping in and coming right back out. It doesn't give you time to even tell yourself that you can handle this. So one, if the stress is going up, we want to look at, are we starting off with something too high on your hierarchy list? So do we need to scale it back? Is Walmart too big? Do we need to just start with the dollar store? Mm, okay. Um, in terms of if you're avoiding stores or public situations. Right. Um, and sometimes it can just be a matter of tweaking a few things. Maybe the person doesn't understand the rationale. So they say, well, I haven't been doing the homework. And that's the big thing that will kind of contribute to why your distress is not moving the right direction. Okay. So what is the typical homework, Jason? Like, let's say I'm coming to you because I was in a bad car accident and now like I have been terrified to drive, you know, I just take public transportation and I don't want to get behind the wheel of a car anymore. What might the homework look like related to that situation? You would guide me how we will build your, your hierarchy list. So it probably would be something like just you not even driving, but sitting in the car. Well, some people are more comfortable with others driving. Some people want to drive themselves. So maybe you're just taking the car around the block. You just stand in the neighborhood for 30, 40 minutes. You're comfortable doing that. Then you would work up to driving over 50 miles per hour. You'll work into driving in traffic. You'll work up to driving in the fast lane. I work with the client who did have, I don't think her trauma was a car accident, but she was really nervous about driving on the highway. So we have to really work up to that. Driving without the GPS because GPS is a safety mechanism. And even though it's some place you know where to go, you're afraid you're going to get lost. So that's how we would kind of work your way up to that. Got you. And are you teaching any kind of grounding exercises so that people can kind of manage their anxiety in the situations? Is that also a part of the homework? That is. So in session one, we go over breathing retraining, where you teach yourself how to relax, how to slow your breathing down and how to focus on your breath. And that's something that you can do throughout the treatment so that you can ground yourself when your your distress level just becomes so heightened that you can't you feel like you feel like you can't manage it. So okay. the breathing component is is key. Got you. 
So session three is where you tell the story and you record it. What is happening in the rest of those sessions? So session four, up until the last session, and that can fluctuate depending on the person, you're coming in, we're going to go over the agenda. So I'll ask you about your homework. What was that like? Making sure you complete the homework. If you did not complete the homework, I want to find out what barriers got in the way, what stopped you. Then we'll go over the imaginal exposure. So you're going to recount your trauma. We're going to do that typically about 30 to 40 minutes on that. So depending on what the traumatic event is, we may go through your trauma three to four times. And for some people, there's not a certain moment. There may be multiple moments. Say, for instance, somebody was in a really bad fight. So there was maybe one part where they were being choked and that was really distressing. Then there was another part where they were calling the police, which was really distressing. So This may have taken place over the span of two to three hours, possibly. We're not going to have time for you to walk through that whole two to three hours. We're going to focus in on what's called hot spots. Those are moments of distress you can really pinpoint and highlight where you really feel like you're in danger and they're still bothering you. So during those sessions four till the end of treatment, we're going to narrow down the hot spots and really talk through those to the point where the distress is, is no longer present. And so that's really what the rest of treatment is. It's kind of you retelling the story until your level of distress feels much more manageable. Right. So you're retelling the story and then you're also working through your, your hierarchy list, which consists of anything that you put on the list that you've been avoiding. So it could be, and it's not always things like if you're using an example of driving, it may not just be driving, but maybe now since the the car accident, you don't talk to certain people who are in the car. You don't, you mm. don't talk to your family. You don't talk to friends. You don't watch any movies to have anything like to do with the cars. So we're putting all of those things on the list. So maybe you used to work out. Now you don't go to the gym anymore. That's going to be on the list. Anything that's that's altered your lifestyle will be on that list. And is there ever a case where you are doing some of this with them, Jason? So some of this in vivo work, is it always on their own or are you accompanying them for some of this? Uh, Now, some clinicians do, but typically it's it's mostly really empowering the the client to do this on their own. Mm -hmm. They'll record it. There's what's called a PE coach app so they can kind of jot down what the activity was, what their distress level was, and then we'll review the homework in session. There's a major component. So to kind of recap, we go over the homework, we talk through the trauma, and then we process the emotions, you know, whatever came out of when you were recapping your trauma. So for instance, if there was a car accident and you're telling me the story, a lot of times we forget certain pieces of the accident. And it's always amazing how we remember certain things after session three, four, five. Up until the end, we're starting to remember the car that was in front of us, what the car looked like, what song was playing on the radio. And we process all those things. In doing so, we figure out, hey, maybe I've not been doing this because of, you know, I don't listen to, let's say, Tupac because Tupac was on the radio at the time and I didn't put that connection together. Right. Okay, so it's also helping them to try to remember any pieces of the story that may have caused them to avoid new things that they didn't even think about at the moment. Right. Yes. Yes, Dr. Joy, you're right. Or again, using the example of the accident, they could be blaming themselves because they swerved and hit the median. But then going through the exposure, you figure out there was a, a big pothole in the road that you were trying to avoid or there was something, you know, there was no where for you to to turn. If you swerve right, you would have hit somebody else and endangered them. And uh, we forget those key pieces when, you know, when we're in the moment and we start to blame ourselves or blame whomever. And so it sounds like how much time then are all of the sessions 90 minutes or just those first two? No, uh, all of the sessions are 90 minutes. So we dedicate roughly about 10 minutes to the homework, 30 minutes to the imaginal exposure, another 30 minutes to the processing of the emotions, and then another 10 minutes to go over the next homework assignment. Got you. Okay, so in that 30 minutes of processing the emotion is when you might point out like some of the connections that you're seeing made between like what they told you in session three and now in session six, an element that they forgot. Yes, yes. So we can always keep in the log of that. And it's important for the clinician to, to be present, to remember, to take notes. Because when you're talking about something so so serious and so important to the patient, you definitely don't want to 
asked questions that you should have known at this point in, in the session. Mm, okay. Is it standard for you to record your own sessions so that you maybe can like go back and watch so you remember like any details or is it all note taking? No, that's a great point. So when I was trained on the protocol, I did have to record the sessions and somebody listened to them and provided me with feedback to make sure that I was certified that I could pass the certification process. Now I don't record the sessions when I was first starting to begin the treatment or administering the treatment I would I would have our sessions recorded. Got you. Okay. So Jason, it's different. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. It's different for what? I was gonna say it's different to listen to yourself being recorded. So the first couple of sessions they're recorded as well and that helps you so that when it's time to talk about the trauma, you're not so focused on how you sound on the speaker. Mm hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, most of us in training have had that experience of having to watch ourselves on tape or listen right. to the tape. Back. <laughs> it's like, oh, my gosh, that sound awful. Yeah. Yeah. So are there certain people, Jason, that this would not be a good fit for? If you're actively suicidal we would want to manage the crisis first. So that would be somebody who we would not provide the treatment for. Okay. There's a lot of myths about, you know, people who maybe you have a substance use addiction, you still could follow the same protocol and you could do the treatment. We would just want to make sure that you're not drinking while you're doing the exercises. So as long as you're, you can manage that, we wouldn't prolong treatment just because you have an addiction. Mm-hmm. I would imagine it might be difficult to do some of this also with anybody who's having any like disruptions in reality. Yeah. So like if you have any type of psychotic disorder and again, it's on a case by case basis, but you don't want to try to administer the treatment to someone who doesn't fit the criteria. So for instance, a lot of times PTSD and generalized anxiety disorder can look similar. And if you don't have an accurate diagnosis and you're trying to do PE with somebody who doesn't have a trauma, but they are anxious about everything, or a lot of things, I should say, then you're going to run into a roadblock if there was not a specific event where they they felt like they were threatened or there was an injury. Because as they're telling the story, you're not going to be able to challenge their emotions because the trauma wasn't there. I mean, a lot of times when people have generalized anxiety disorder, the anxiety doesn't necessarily come from like some traumatic experience. And so there isn't really an emotion to connect it to. Yeah, that's correct. Somebody else who would not be a good candidate, personality disorder, so like antisocial personality disorder, you want to make sure, again, some people may have been in multiple fights and committed numerous crimes and it may seem traumatic. But then if you try to administer this, the protocol the person will actually say, well, I enjoyed this physical altercation. And so when you're trying to to manage their distress, you're going to run into a roadblock. Right, because they really don't have any distress. Right. (laughs) (laughs) At least related to what you think what might be trauma. Exactly. Got you. So it sounds like a lot of this really depends on an accurate diagnosis. Having an accurate diagnosis is so important. Okay. Okay. Are there any other uses for PE, Jason, besides PTSD? Well, still, if you have certain phobias, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily, you would still use um, a component of it, which would be the exposure therapy. Right. If, say, you're afraid of spiders or snakes, you can still use the exposure component. But for PE in particular, PTSD would be the primary use of the treatment. Okay. So, Jason, if somebody's listening and they're thinking like, okay, even though this sounds like I might not want to do this, it sounds like it actually could be good for me. How might they find a therapist who is trained administering PE? I will send you a few links to sites that have actual clinicians who are trained in the in the protocol. Because you don't want to just seek out any, I mean, we're therapists. Therapists are are great. However, this protocol, myself, I would not be as uh, efficient in if I did not have the training. Right. It's not something that you can just kind of pick up and run with because they're going to start talking about the trauma and then they're going to stop. And if you don't know what to do, how to get them back in the moment, in the session, you're not going to be re-traumatizing them, but you're going to almost kind of be selling them a bad deal. Mm Mm-hmm. Because they're going to walk away from the session thinking that, hey, this wasn't helpful. If you don't understand the rationale, you're not going to be able to to sell it, to provide them with the confidence and the reassurance that they need. 
So I kind of want to go back to something that you said earlier in terms of like sessions one and two about providing the buy-in. You already kind of mentioned that people are like, oh, how is that going to help me to retail this? Are there other common things that come up for people when they are maybe a little resistant to trying this? I will say figuring out the time. And also you want to make sure that your spouse or your family, they don't necessarily need to know what you're discussing in the session. But I found when working with certain individuals, if their family knows that they are going to be dedicating a significant amount of time to this treatment, then that helps them because they have more support at home. So they're less likely to avoid. Is there ever a point where you might bring family members in as a part of the session or no? Most definitely. If okay. with the client's permission, definitely when going over the the list of things that you're going to not avoid, sometimes family and friends, they want to help. So for instance, if you have difficulty in restaurants and crowded settings and you like to sit where you can see the exit, because a lot of times with PTSD, we have hypervigilance. So being able to see where everything is at and seeing the exit is key. And family may go along and say, yes, give us that booth in the corner. But if family knows that you're working on not avoiding, then they'll be more apt to say, well, let's just sit in the middle, even though it's going to be tough. But I'm here with you. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've had great success when spouses or family members have been present, again, not throughout the entire sessions, but just for a brief moment to get their buy-in and support because it's, it's so tough working with trauma. We keep it to ourselves. We feel ashamed, embarrassed, guilty, all of the above. So the more support we can have, the better. Yeah, and I would imagine that this is something that family members and, you know, other loved ones would really be excited about because I think a lot of times people don't know how to support their loved ones, but this feels very tangible, right? Like I can sit here with you as we kind of sit in the middle of the restaurant and not go towards, you know, the booth that looks at the exit. So it gives them something very tangible to do. Very much so. And also early on in the sessions, when we go over those common reactions to trauma, that's something that I always encourage patients to discuss, you know, if they're comfortable so that now your family, they can support you in that way and say, oh, this is why you, you know, have trouble sleeping or this is why you have trouble showing affection. This is why you have such a, a bad view of, of other people. You don't trust anybody, you know, have more empathy and, and not just sympathy. Right, right. So you mentioned already, Jason, that you have a certification in doing this. So typically are people or providers who administer PE, do they have this same kind of certification? Typically they do. So okay. I've gone through the training a couple of times and it's always good to go through it over the years, as you know, keeping up your, your skill set and staying up to date with the latest and greatest. So one place that people can visit will be the Center for Deployment Psychology. They provide training. Also, the Department of Veteran Affairs, they provide training as well. Okay, got you. And are there any resources that you would suggest for anybody who wants to know more about this? Like, you know, clients who may be thinking this might be a good fit for them. Are there resources that you typically suggest? Yes, there's a couple of trusted YouTube links that I, I, I like to show the patients, too, because when they hear from other patients who've completed the, the protocol, then I think it gives them more hope. And something, again, tangible, they can see that, okay, this has worked for this person, even though they felt like they couldn't ever drive again or couldn't ever enjoy concerts again, because, again, they can be overwhelming just thinking about doing those things. Right. So showing, right. Those, showing those clips helps a lot. Okay. So we'll also include those in the show notes once you send those to me. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So where can people find out more information about you, Jason? Can you share your website as well as any social media handles you'd like to share? Sure. Uh, my Instagram handle is jphillipsmsw, J-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S-M-S-W. And my website is www.pnpcoach.com. Great. And of course, we will include that in the show notes for anybody who may be driving or can't take it down for whatever reason. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us today, Jason. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Joy. I really enjoyed this podcast talking with you. Thank you. I'm so thankful Jason was able to share his expertise with us today. Be sure to grab your phone right now and share this episode with two friends who you think would really enjoy it. To find out more information about Jason and his practice, visit the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 104. Remember that if you're searching for a therapist in your area, check out our directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And make sure to visit our online store at therapyforblackgirls.com slash shop 
where you can find our guided affirmation track, breakup journal, or your new favorite Therapy for Black Girls t-shirt or mug. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care. <laughs>